Good morning, good evening, wherever you are across the world and the universe. Welcome to my Quantum Living Podcast, where we talk about things that matter at the intersection of science and spirituality. I'm your host, Anna Anderson, quantum counselor and teacher, intuitive guide, author and podcaster, and above all, an inquisitive soul. This show is about how we can bring the various spiritual, metaphysical, and esoteric concepts and ancient wisdom, validated by quantum physics and modern cosmology, to the very practical level to improve and enrich our life experience as individuals, communities, and the humankind. My intention for this podcast is to be engaging, educational, empowering, and fun, but it may also surprise or even shock you as we venture into deep rabbit holes and out on a limb as far as we can. Each conversation is different, each guest is unique, each episode is a story with profound wisdom you may want to listen to more than once. So sit back, relax and enjoy this episode. Okay, let's begin. Hello and welcome back to Quantum Living. I will take a wild guess that the majority of people listening to this podcast have an open or hidden fascination with the paranormal. Why is that? And what exactly are the things or experiences we call paranormal? To begin with, this term becomes increasingly inaccurate, if not misleading. The prefix para is Latin meaning over or beyond. So paranormal means beyond or outside the normal. Consequently, all kinds of extrasensory perception or ESP like clairvoyance, clairaudience, telekinesis, channeling, ghosts, life after death, reincarnation, energy healing, human auras, remote viewing, and the like, by this definition, are considered not normal. If you have listened to my recent episodes, Real Magic, The Future of Science, The Secrets of Remote Viewing, and The Science of Channeling, you would agree with me that these phenomena are slowly but surely becoming part of our normal life. And while they may not be yet fully explained by science, the fast-growing evidence of their existence cannot be refuted. Still, we've got used to the term paranormal. We know what it means, we are kind of comfy with it, as we say here in Oz, and find its mysticism alluring and exciting. So, to lure you all to this podcast, I have unashamedly titled it Embracing the Paranormal. And that's what I'll be talking about today with my special guest, who is an expert in this field, Kadrick Olson. Kadrick is an author, speaker, teacher, and paranormal expert with over 30 years of experience of guiding people through their supernatural and spiritual concerns. From his early childhood and throughout his life, Kadrick has led a paranormal life. Living in a haunted house full of spirits taught him how to connect with the spiritual realms. Growing up by attending a spiritualist church, he has learned the art of seance and channeling. Kadrick's lifetime connection with advanced beings, called the Whisperers, gave him a keen awareness of the landscape of the afterlife and the knowledge of how to work with various entities. His specialties include paranormal arts training, shadow work, runes, and Norse mysticism. Kadrick was featured in numerous TV and radio shows and documentaries, including Gaia and Coast to Coast AM. And now, Kadrick joins me from Denver, Colorado. Hello, Kadrick. Welcome to Quantum Living. It's a pleasure to have you on my show. Hello, and thank you for having me here. That was a wonderful intro. I appreciate that very much. Thank you. (laughs) And I am not finished yet. (laughs) All right. Wow, what a wonderful smorgasbord of mystical experiences and phenomena you offer, teach about, and help people with. 
your deep knowledge and expertise in this field is known internationally. So I thought, gosh, he's the expert I want to have on my show. And here we are. <laughs> awesome. Now, I don't usually make personal remarks about my guests, but on this occasion, I will, as I feel it is fitting and relevant to our conversation. From the moment I saw you and heard you speak for the first time, which I believe it was on Gaia a few years ago, I could sense that you have a strong connection with the spirit world. There is something magnetic and powerful about you. And it's not just your physical appearance, as some people might refer to. I didn't include these descriptors in your bio, but spiritually, I see you as a mystic, alchemist, and wizard. So because it ties in into our conversation, I would like to, and I feel this quite strongly, so I would like to make this point. So... To set the scene for our conversation, could you please share with us your personal story, including your ancestral background, if important and relevant to this conversation? And I will also add to this, do you have a recollection of your particular past life and feel a strong connection with any personality of that time? Oh, yes. In fact, I think I'll start with that that part of the question, because it is something I have been exploring and curious and looking into. And I do have a pretty clear recollection of several past lifetimes. And the other day, of course, it always happens like when I'm driving or doing something completely unexpected, little bits of insight popped in, little downloads. And I got to see how these past lives all connected, how that one led on to the other and to the next, and to the next. For example, I do remember one being in Rome as sort of a gladiator warrior type, but I was not a good person. I was not a good person about that at all. And in fact, I rather enjoyed causing the suffering that I was doing. The next two lifetimes after that were in the Old Norse time period. Well, actually, three of them, but two of them were still being a pretty awful person. The third one, though, the third one is where I got some insight to the spiritual connection, the connection of all of us. I got an understanding of the runes, and I started working more with the mystical layers. And that was an eye-opening experience for me about how we're all connected and how that suffering was, how it's affecting everybody. So I chose to move on. I chose to, to learn other things. And in the next lifetime, I was a prince in India. I remember being in this nice, big, opulent home, almost like a castle, but I was frustrated with my parents. I was frustrated with my family because for some reason, I was aware of the plight of the people going on around that were poor, that were not as well off as we were. And that bothered me. That bothered me that we had such, such wealth. And these people were not, and I wanted to figure out how to help them out. And that frustrated me a lot. And I ended up dying in that lifetime very frustrated. The next lifetime was a Buddhist monk. And from a very early age, I went into the monastery, went right into the temple as a child. And I never set foot outside of that building ever again for the rest of my life. I remember being a very old man trying to tell people that the the mystical th teachings that you seek, the, the spiritual connection you seek is outside of these walls. We've got to get out there. We've got to be teaching. We've got to be expressing this. It has to be there. And there was just utter refusal for that. I remember being a teacher of other children who were brought into this temple to basically be the same kind of lifetime I was, and again, died very frustrated. A lifetime after that was in pre-revolutionary France as a very thin, frail woman. Because I had made the decision, okay, I'm not getting locked into these doors. I'm not going to be a man. I'm not going to be stuck under these conditions. I'm going to be a woman. I'm going to be in a place where there's some liberation so I could teach this material. Well, the problem is a woman trying to teach that kind of stuff in pre-revolutionary France was not okay. And I led an untimely fate, you know, in a deep, dark place because it was the only way to shut up some woman teaching this. So I made the decision that's it. We're coming back as a big man, and I'm going to make sure that these teachings get taught. 
And that lifetime, dare I say, is actually a fairly notable figure in many circles. You can actually see photographs of this person, compare them to me, and we look almost identical. I pulled his astrology chart and my astrology chart, and I showed it to my mom, who was a professional astrologer for a lot of years. She looked at them both, and she and I didn't tell her who this was. And she looked at them, she, and instantly she goes, oh, this was you in a past life. And I'm like, aha. Is it Nostradamus? Nope. It's Albert Pike. Ah. Uh huh. It was Albert Pike. And I know he has somewhat of a notorious history, but it, the notorious part of his history doesn't match from my un- recollection of my understanding of it. And so I went through that lifetime less frustrated, but still not quite there. Now, this lifetime is bringing forward those teachings and moving into a new stage of the development. The stuff that I've been trying to teach since I was a Buddhist monk has reached a new stage of development and a new way of growth. So that is why we're here doing shadow work. That's why we're here connecting with the paranormal. That's why we're here really understanding where we exist at this higher level state of being, what is holding us in, let's say, this 3D reality, and how we can do our shadow work to pull ourselves out of that 3D reality, move into our higher 5D state of being, which is what we're here to experience. And what I've understood from all of those lifetimes, even the the ones that were, let's say, villainous or awful, brutal, I needed those lifetimes so that I could understand that degree of suffering, so that I could be a part of this world in that way, so that I knew how to work through that myself at the spiritual level, so that when we get to this point in time, at this place in human history, I can bring those teachings forward to a wider audience of people who need that same kind of healing and growth. And I would not have been able to do that if I had not opted to be that kind of a person throughout those lifetimes. Absolutely. So you are consciously continuing on your soul journey. So how did you start on this path in this lifetime? Was there a particular pivotal point or was it just a a very natural pathway for you? It was a very natural pathway for me. My parents were already doing this. They were already open and aware of the, the paranormal, the supernatural. They were aware of the different spirituality type things that were out there. And I grew up in a house that was haunted. Like you could see the TV dial changing channels. You could hear footsteps going up and down the hallway. And I was in communication with these spirits. I had communicated with what I call the whisperers since I was in elementary school, since I was, you know, seven, eight years old. I knew about the spirits in the house. My sister, though, she's seven years older than I am. She was dead afraid of all of these things. She couldn't stand being around that stuff. But I was a, now as a kid, of course, being seven years younger than her, that kind of supercharged me a little bit to be a little like, oh, my sister's afraid of these things. Should I be afraid of it? But at the same time, I'm like, I'm communicating with them. They're not scary. And when my parents realized that I was communicating with spirits and I talked to them about visions I was having, about the things that were going on, they told me that they needed to go back to the church that they were going to when I was a very little baby. And I have little tiny memories of it. And it was a spiritualist church which is like your typical Protestant church, but they include transmediumship, channeling at the end of the session. And every Saturday night, my parents took me to the church where they had seances in the basement. So from a very young age, I was exposed to this. It was like a natural, normal part of my world. As I started to grow older and I started to get curious about what else is out there, I was fortunate that my parents' basement was basically a library. All of the walls of the basement were like floor to ceiling with books on everything you can imagine, encyclopedias, anything, anything you want to know about. And there was a big section about Wicca and witchcraft and the paranormal. My mom absolutely loved the Jane Roberts books about Seth, Seth Speaks. She, she was infatuated with those immensely. And when I found Secret Teachings of All Ages in that basement, it was a big tome-sized book by Manly P. Hall. I dove into it. Now, mind you, I was like 11, 12 years old, maybe, when I got into this book. And I'm like devouring it. I'm just like reading it. I'd be up late at night. Instead of doing my homework, I was reading this book. 
And it occurred to me that all of these mystery schools that Manly P. Hall was describing in there were all saying the same thing. They were just using different mythological structures. They were using different words, but they were all saying the same thing about how it affected human consciousness. And I knew I needed to have, let's say, a control group at that point. I knew I needed to have one solid ground that I needed to study. And that moment that I was realizing that is when I was exploring the runes, when I was listening to some really crazy music coming out of the UK and reading books about the the Norse stuff. And I didn't realize it, but that was the moment when all of those things converged at once to say, here's where you begin. Here's your path that you start. And so I took to it like a fish to water. I dove into the Norse studies. I was reading about the runes, studying the runes. I eventually got to the point where I was translating the poetic and the prose edda and some of the sagas for myself. You know, I, I, I can't speak the language, but I can read it well enough that I can translate, if you know what I mean. And so I was translating these texts for myself and getting a deeper understanding of what was written in those texts. So that's what led me to write my book, Runes for Transformation. That's why I was teaching for a long time about Norse mysticism and runes until I had a chance encounter with a good friend of mine. She's a good friend now, but at that time, she was running a seance. And I just helped out because that's what I did. That was like, I communicated with spirits. I knew what I was doing. And after the seance was over, I was talking with her and a paranormal team that was from New Orleans. And they were talking about some of the problems they were having. And I'm like, oh, yeah, I see what you got. You got a bit of an attachment. It's not a big deal. It's not a malevolent attachment. Just I gave a list of things for them to do to take care of it so that it wasn't a problem. And they looked at me with this like inquisitive look. And they're like, what do you mean? What, what are you talking about? And I'm like, what do you mean? What am I talking about? This is like, to me, it was obvious, right? It's like, because I grew up with it. it. Even though I was in my 40s at that time, to me, this was like super obvious. Like, why aren't you just doing this? You're a paranormal team. And then talking with my friends on that subject, I was like, oh, this is a big gap that I'm not teaching. I'm not teaching this paranormal stuff that to me is a natural, normal part of my life. I'm, this is a huge area that's missing. And I went, okay, I need to start developing programs because I was already teaching Norse mysticism and runes. I was already teaching pagan men's spirituality to help men identify with sacred masculinity. I was already working on that. I was starting my development on learning how to do shadow work and teach shadow work. And then the paranormal popped in and said, why aren't you teaching this stuff too? Because you know this innately. And I went, okay, this is too much to teach. <laughs> <laughs> this is too much going on. But that's all a part of where I, I'm at. And that's kind of what led me to where I am today. Wow, what a story. Thank you for sharing. So yes, it all has developed very naturally. And clearly you chose those specific parents and with those characteristics and, and that environment. So beautiful story. Okay. As I said earlier, you offer a really nice smorgasbord of, of services, of various courses, teaching classes, which we'll come back to a bit later on in this conversation. What I would like to focus on at this point and talk about is out of the um, paranormal arts training, shadow work, past life regression and runes, Norse mysticism, Galdracraft, if I pronounce it properly. <laughs> Could you please speak to, firstly, the shadow work, what it is and why we need it, essentially, why is it of benefit? And then please speak to Galdracraft and the runes. You got it. So shadow work is an important part of our spiritual growth that often gets ignored. And a way that I can sort of relate to that is there's an old alchemical hermetic phrase of salve et coagula. And salve basically means to dissolve, you know, putting some sugar in water, it dissolves. Or, you know, you, you have something that needs to be removed, you dissolve it. Coagula is to build up. Think of like blood cells that coagulate. So it's building up. Now, when we look at some of the modern new age practices of like affirmations or the law of attraction, the miracle club, think and grow rich, vision boards, all of these things, they're definitely very powerful manifestation tools, but people are running into the same problems over and over and over again. The stuff that they're doing, and they're doing it exactly as they're told to do, 
but it's not manifesting anything. Or maybe they're trying to manifest one thing and something else manifests, or they manifest it and it just gets disrupted. There's some sort of a scattering field. There's something something blocking them from achieving that manifestation. And that has led a lot of people to say, well, see, law of attraction, it's bogus. There's all of this think and grow rich. It's not true. It's fake. Well, that's all coagula work. All of that is completely coagula. And if you're trying to build up on a foundation that's already shaky, that's already faltery, then all of that you're building up is going to fall apart. So what you need to do is clear out that foundation, clear the stuff out of the way, the salve work. And that's where shadow work comes in. That's where we go into the deep, dark, ugly places within the psyche, within the soul that tell us, oh, you don't deserve to have this. Oh, you're not worthy of having that. Oh, if you get this stuff, you're just going to blow it and you're going to mess it up. Oh, if you get this kind of stuff, you're taking away from all those other people who need it and you don't really need it. So we've got these inner dialogues. We've got these inner feelings. We've got all of these inner beliefs that are preventing that manifestation from happening. Or they could keep you from having the life that your soul wants, like your higher self came into this life, came into this existence with a purpose. It has an intention that it's trying to fulfill. And the life that we've lived, where we grew up with, the schools, the family, the communities that was around us, told us certain things that we had no choice but to believe to be true. And so we took all of those things on to be true for us. And now we get into our 20s, our 30s, our 40s, and these things that once held true that actually did serve us are holding us back from living our ideal life from living a life full of purpose and fulfillment and meaning because we're chasing some of these same things over and over again. I see this a lot in the paranormal. Somebody might be drawn to seances. They might be drawn to a Ouija board, but they grew up being told that the Ouija board and interacting with spirits is how your soul goes to hell, that these are all demons trying to get at you. So now this person is conflicted. They're like, I'm curious about this. I'm feeling this pull. I'm hearing these spirits talking to me, but it's scaring the heck out of me. I'm so scared. I don't know what I'm doing. I'm shutting it down. So we do shadow work. And what shadow work entails is mm. it's not pushing it down. It's not stuffing away, which some people tend to do. They're like, you know, just breathe peace, love, and light into it. It'll go away. If you're feeling angry, just breathe peace, peace love, and light, and you'll feel happy again. Shadow work is, no, we're going to go into those deep, dark, ugly places. <laughs> we're going to make friends with those yeah. things. We're going to get into that inner fear that says, you know, you're not worthy of having anything that's enjoyable in life. We're going to get into that. We're going to feel that. We're going to have a conversation with that part of you. We're going to experience that shadow energy for what it was. Come to the realization that this is a, one of the most shocking parts about shadow work is this thing that is holding you back, this thing that is disrupting your life, thinks it's helping you. You develop these shadow traits at some point in your life because your psyche said, I need that. I need to survive. I need to think these things. I need to do these things. I need to believe this way because it's the only way I can survive. So it adapts to its environment. And now when we're older, they're a hindrance. And when we come to this understanding that the shadow part is actually something beneficial or was beneficial, that it was helpful, we can have a bit of gratitude. We can have a bit of understanding. And mind you, that understanding, that awareness is the light. We're casting that light onto that shadow to reveal it for what it really is. And when you do that, you find out actually something really amazing and wonderful about yourself. This thing that was like stopping you from manifesting something for you. You look into that shadow and you're like, oh, this is really what I want for me is this thing. And now that you're aware of that and you have that and you can integrate that new feeling, then you go back to do your manifestation work and it works beautifully because you're not getting in your own way. And so if we ignore these things, if we try to set them aside, they're just going to lodge in deeper. They're going to be more disruptive until they get their voice heard, until you can acknowledge what they are and what they're doing. And when you do that, they become an ally. They work in, with you. They conspire in favor for you. And then all of a sudden life is just like flowing so much smoother. And it feels like magic. When I have people go through my six-week course, they start off a little bit trepidatious, a little unsure. They're going through it. But you know, by week five, by week six, they're like, I don't understand. I'm doing the work that you give to me, but like my income is doubled. I had somebody whose their income has doubled. 
some people are starting to go into self-help programs that they were afraid to go into. They're getting the help and the care that they need for themselves. They're rewarding themselves where before they just felt that they needed to work harder and that they needed to only give to other people instead of give to themselves. And they're finding that all of the stuff that they wanted and thought would make their life better is being drawn to them automatically. They don't have to pursue it. It's like magnetically coming to them because they're no longer repelling it because it shadows. There's no, you're not worthy. You don't deserve this. But they resolve that shadow energy and it's like, it's boom, it's right there. Absolutely. So in essence, the uh, manifestation work or the spiritual work or creating our life as we want it work is true alchemy. You need to dissolve some ingredients first to create something different out of it. It is true alchemy. In a very real sense, yes, because you are taking the lead of those shadow traits yeah. and transmuting them into golden into states gold. that you can reabsorb. Yeah. <laughs> and we can take it a step further. I do have a, a yeah. shadow alchemy ritual that I teach people where when they are able to be aware of what one of their shadow traits are that they need to work with, they take it to the air level. They write what it is. They d- they give it a name, they describe it, and they write down what that is. So there's the air. Then they feel what the emotions are connected to this, which is the water. Then they notice where it is in the body. They feel that feeling in the body. They notice that it's embodied and how that affects their life through their behavior and what's going on, which is the earth. And then they're aware of the intensity of that energy, the intensity, the passion that's in there, and that's the fire. And then we transmute all of that. We clear it all away. We clear it off. And then we have them imagine what this ideal state would be in this higher state. And then you describe that with your air. You get a feeling for what that feels like. You put that energy back into that part of the body where we clear the stuff away. And then you just amp it up. You supercharge it. You breathe into it. And you make it super powerful, which is the fire. But then we take it a step further. We drop into a meditation Imagine what things would be like in the future with this energy guiding you in a similar situation would have triggered that shadow trait. And then you let it play out and pay attention to the feeling after the the event plays out. And that new feeling, you integrate that. You breathe into it, you supercharge it, you breathe it, you integrate it into your body because that energy that comes from the imagined result of the situation is the quintessence. And as you're using that quintessence, it will affect the causal realms and it will bring all of those pieces and parts into alignment to just make it fall into place for you. Beautiful. So it is true energy work. Absolutely. We need to be mindful and, well, mindful understand to begin with that everything is energy and whatever work, mental, spiritual, psychological, emotional, we do, we are working with energy, essentially. So so that's when this element comes into place. One other question that popped into my mind as you were speaking, in your process, like the one that you have just described, do you include physical elements such as writing down on a piece of paper the blockage or the shadow part of you and then burning it, like physically burning it to release it? Not quite. What we tend to do with that is you do write it on a piece of paper and then for the water, you literally have some water and you let yourself feel it and pour it into a bowl. For the earth, I have people take a little ugly rock. They go out and find a little ugly rock and they're holding that while they feel that and they put the rock on a platform. And for fire, they light a black candle so that they can recognize intensity. Then you clear it all away. You dump the water out. You rip up the paper and blow the paper into a trash can so that you're using that whole air element to put into the trash can. Dump everything all out, blow out the candle, all of that. And then when you do the whole phase over, again, you write on a paper. And then this time when you fill up the, the cup of water, you drink the water with that trait so that you're bringing it into you. And instead of an ugly rock, you take a crystal and you feel that new energy integrating into you as a crystalline form. And you put that on the platform and then you light a golden candle 
And then you feel that new energy swelling up within you with that gold candle. So those are the physical tools that we use to represent that. So you are engaging all the senses in the process. Beautiful. Uh, do you offer those courses only physically in the room or also online? Oh, they're all online. Oh, they're all online. Okay. Mm -hmm. I, I can okay. meet physically people here. I have a great office space where I'm at right now and I can see people and sometimes I do. But I would say over 90% of the people I work with, the clients and everything, clients and students, we're all online. Oh, okay. What is Galdracraft? Galdracraft. We're going to go into runes territory for this because Galdracraft is all about runes. Okay. Okay. Let's combine the two. Yeah. Basically, runes are the written form of Proto-Norse and Old Norse languages. And it's we got to be specific to remember that because the word rune comes to us from Old Norse and it means mystery or the unknowable, like universal sacred mystery. And that's what the runes were to the Old Norse people, representing sacred, mysterious things. And of course, it was their written, their form of writing. And one of the things we have to keep in mind in the Old Norse time period, there is no reference and there's no archaeological evidence that runes were ever used for divination. Runes as a divinatory tool, as best as I can discover, did not happen until the 1980s. So... Runes, though, of course, they were for writing. They were, you know, carved on stone, shipping tags, all sorts of things. They were used as a written form of writing, but they were also used for magical working, you know, for protection, for health and healing, to assist in childbirth, for example. They were used for all manner of magical working. And I find it very interesting that our English word of spelling is related to the word, you know, spell, to cast a spell. And in Old Norse, to cast a spell, you would use runes, which were their letters, their language. Exactly. So they're all related in that way. Ah, uh, interesting. Yeah. Could you remind us, when you're referring to Norse people, are we talking about the Vikings who lived in today's mm -hmm. Norway? Could you just give us the Absolutely, location? Absolutely, yes. The, it, the Norse places that I'm talking about are like Denmark, Sweden, Norway, and Ice and Iceland. Even Greenland, it started to venture out there. And I'll do a little bit of a soapbox moment here when we talk about Viking, because Viking is more of a modern word. In the Old Norse times, the old, old Norse times, when it was the Viking era, or shall we say Viking era, the, the term Viking it was referring to people who were born on the water, like a wick, like a, a, a strait of water. So, and the when you end a word in ing, it means somebody who is born of. So it was basically people who are born of the water. And the people who were considered vikingar, they basically got on boats mostly for trading, trading with other peoples all over the place, rarely for raiding. And that was basically a part-time summer job. It wasn't actually a people. It was just like fry cook or delivery man. It was just a it was just a title of a job. <laughs> but they did get a notorious history because okay. one of the downsides about Norse history is they did not record their history very well until about the 1300s. Wherever they went to, whatever they did, the history was often recorded by the sore losers or the people that had conflict with them. So a lot of this stuff got inflated and exaggerated. Mm, bias. Exactly. And the Norse <laughs> were pretty guilty of exaggerating their own stories too. And mm. so eventually, when we are reading the sagas that were written down in the 1300s, the 1400s, when we come across the word viking, it actually is in refer reference to a despicable person, like one of the, an antagonist that usually meets a very yeah. ignoble ending to his life. And so I'm fascinated that when the Wagnerian movement took off in Germany and the, you know, uh, Wagner, the Denis Boulogne, all of that, that's where they recovered yeah. the word Viking. Mm -hmm. And we, in our English speaking, we mispronounce it as Viking, but that's where they started to try to recover it. And then it became a misnomer for a population or a people when it was at one point just a part-time summer job. <laughs> <laughs> but yes, it, it refers okay. basically to Scandinavian countries and 
okay. people who lived around the 800s to 1100s. Okay, mm -hmm. thank you. So now back to the power of yes. runes. So yeah, okay. so runes, of course, back then were the written language, but it was also at the mystical level, at the very mystical level, it was a sacred language. So it was a way for our consciousness to connect with the universe. It was a tool for raising your your level of consciousness to a higher state of being. It's written in the lore. It's very subtly written in the lore. Little phrases like that really refer to runes being created in a time before time, in a place before places, and that they were sung into existence, telling us that runes are actually vibrations. They're vibratory frequencies that run through the subtle layers of existence. And what that further tells us is those little shapes that we see carved onto little bits of stone or wood in the New Age metaphysical bookstores, those aren't runes. Those are staves. Runes are the energies that these staves remind us of. So like if we were to look at the rune Urus, that represents primal energy, primal power, strength. Think of it like a bison, a buffalo, or some big bovine type creature, right? Bison type creature. Mm -hmm. And you think about how big and powerful that is. And you squish all of that energy into a human being. That can be very healing. That could be a lot of strength and power. And that's where they use the, ru the word urus is in reference to an extinct European bison called the Oroks. And then the shape that they gave it reminds us about that primal strength. And when we sing the name Urus, when we're doing like this Urus, Urus, we're tapping into that primal strength within us. And that's where the secret power mm -hmm. of the secret power. Yeah, the secret power of the runes comes from is literally singing them. That's what the Old Norse did. There's a form of Old Norse magic that where that is all about singing the runes. It's mm -hmm. all about a certain type of poetry for singing the runes so that you could tap into their energies. You can trans tap into their transformational power. And that form of magic is called Galdr, which is the root word for Galdra craft, because the Old Norse word for power is craft. So when we put Galdr and craft together, it basically means rune songs of power. Ah, and that's what okay. Galdra Craft is all about. It's about me taking runes in their original way that they were used, what we can pick up from archaeology and the scholars who really know this stuff really well, and then applying that to music, because that was the traditional way of working with runes was to sing them. And so I just put it into a modern format. And so all of my music in Galdra Craft is a modern representation of singing the runes to create transformational transformation in your life, basically. Right. So these are musical pieces, if you like. Yes. Okay. So in other words, when you go to your local New Age store and you buy runes, which are usually a bunch of stones with those writings on them mm -hmm. and in a little pouch and they come with instructions and you cast them, you throw them on, on the table and you just read them looking at the instructions. That's not proper divination or working with the runes energy, is it right? It's not traditional, but it works. And okay. my ultimate opinion is if what you're doing gets you the results that you need, do it. And so if somebody buys a, a pouch of runes from a metaphysical bookstore and they're doing divination with it and it works, I'm not stopping them. Mm -hmm. Go for it. Because my ultimate opinion is that the Old Norse ancestors created a path for us that led up to a certain place. And they don't want us to retread that path that they did. They want us to take what they've built, what they've created, and create a path forward for ourselves and for our children and for their children. And so if we're in the modern mm -hmm. day and we're using a Dremel tool to carve runes or other kind of rotary tools to carve runes into stone and wood, go for it. If we're finding that divination with runes is a powerful, effective use for it in the modern period and it works, go for it. Because that's us building that pathway forward based on what the ancestors left us. Okay. So what I'm getting here is that the proper or the original runes that we you are talking about is not pieces of rocks with some writing on it, but it is the singing Correct. of 
those symbols as you understand them, which create the energy that you are looking for. Mm -hmm. So whether we use rocks or a piece of paper or whatever other material that we Correct. can write those symbols on, it doesn't Correct. really matter. It doesn't make any difference. Exactly. As long as it's, it's working for us. <laughs> in, in fact, the Norse lore actually supports that. And, and I will, I, you know, once upon a time, I might have been one of those people that says, no, they have to be in a fruit bearing tree and you have to put blood in them to activate them. And they have to be this way. <laughs> I would have been that way well, maybe 20 years ago, 25 years ago. But doing a deeper, careful analysis of the Old Norse poems, there's one called the Sigurd, Sigurd Rifumo, which is about a Valkyrie that was struck by a, a sleep thorn and placed in a circle of fire because she basically defied Odin's uh, orders about which side in battle could win. And then Sigurd, our hero, comes in and rescues her from that. And when she awakens, she teaches him all these secrets about runes about how to use runes. And she initiates him into the runic mysteries. And in one little passage about of her awakening and her teaching Sigurd about the runes, it basically says runes are in your mind. They're hug runes, mind runes. There are book runes that you write down in a book that you have there. They are on bare mm. paw, on horn, on nail. They're on everything, everywhere. That they could be in your mind, that they could be mal runes, speech runes that you're speaking, that runes are everywhere. They're not just limited to being stone or wood or in any specific way that they could be in modern terms. If you have a Sharpie and a piece of paper, it doesn't matter. What that means is that stave form that you're looking at is connecting you to that vibratory essence of that secret unknowable part of the rune, the mystery part of the rune. And that's the true rune. So that's similar to the uh, secret geometry that speaks to our unconscious mind, Correct. again, because we are looking at the physical representation, so there is a marking or particular symbol which speaks to our unconscious mind, just like sacred geometry, and again, at the same time, having a particular energy about it that we can work exactly. with. Exactly. You're absolutely right. The shapes of the runes all have 60 and 120 degree angles, the same angles that you find in the Flower of Life, and the same angles that you find in water crystals. That sacred geometry, all of those things are found in the runes themselves. Mm, fascinating. Okay, let's move on because we have so much so much to talk about. <laughs> While we are talking about the energy and you mentioned a few minutes ago spirit attachment or entity attachment, let's talk about the concept or concepts because they all sort of tie together of dark or negative energy versus light or positive energy. And my question, sub-question here is, have you had any dangerous spirit encounters? And what about entity attachment on or spirit possession? So can we just look at the, the interplay, if you like, of the light and darkness, positive and negative, and what is your experience Absolutely. with it? Absolutely. To start this, I'd like to kind of build off of something you were saying earlier, and it's one of the things I teach people about energy all the time, is that energy is emotion. Energy is thoughts. Energy and information of all kinds. Energy is just information. So energy, thoughts, emotion, information, they're all synonymous. They're the same thing. It's just what you do with it. And so if we were to create a spectrum of our emotions, let's say at the bottom is hatred and disgust, you know, some of these just awful things. And at the top, maybe uh, enjoyment, happiness, awe, and wonder. In fact, I think awe and wonder is probably the highest end of the spectrum. Love. Love exactly. This is where we start yeah. to see what we have been calling light and dark, positive and negative. And I'm actually trying to work to let us move through that to see them as a spectrum rather than a binary kind of thing. Like when we say light and dark or good and evil, 
positive, negative, that it's a spectrum of what it means to be human. And that sometimes we need these things. Like for example, with shadow work, I've, I've worked with a lot of people who've gone through like the new age circles of teaching. And when they feel that they get angry, they're worried that they're not doing their spiritual work because they consider anger to be a negative emotion. They consider that anger to be this negative thing. And some people get downright afraid at adding more to that negativity because they they feel that they are a spiritual person. They've worked with spiritual beings and they know that energy and emotions are connected. And when they get angry, they're afraid that they're going to pull in something malevolent because of their anger energy. And then of course they get to that fear and that fear also could draw in something malevolent feeding off of that fear. And so we work with our shadow work to realize that the anger actually might be a needed thing. They sometimes need to set boundaries. Sometimes that anger is that motivation to get things going. Sometimes that anger helps to stop somebody from trying to hurt them. So they see that that anger paired with their higher self can actually be a very positive thing. But what the shadow was, was their fear that they weren't adequate because they were still feeling anger. And with that said, if we were to come across an entity, and I have seen this, I've actually seen a, a person's higher guide coming in, creating a fear state for this person, because this person was making some very bad choices for their life, moving things in a very not good direction for them. And one of their guides came through, did the whole banging on the walls, flickering the lights, scaring the hell out of them, not for a bad thing but to encourage them off of the path that they were starting to go through. So this is why I start to tell people, let's not look at these things as binary. Let's look at them as a spectrum of human existence. And that takes away some of that judgment of that we're now dealing with demonic entities or that we're dealing with evil things because Doctor Who said it the best. And I know it's fiction, but I love this line out of Doctor Who. Evil is just a matter of what side of the fork you're on. <laughs> And the reason why I, <laughs> the reason why I say that is let's say it's a somebody's good one. at home. <laughs> yeah, I love it. Because let's say somebody is at home for whatever reason, they're awake at late late at night, three o'clock in the morning. They're sitting in a room all by themselves and suddenly get the they get the creep out feeling. Mm -hmm. They get that like, oh, oh, I'm not alone. There's something here. And they're feeling like this very strong fear state build up and they're like, oh no, I know there's something bad here. What's going on? I, I need some help. I need to call angels. I need to call an exorcist or whatever. They're like in this fear state mm -hmm. and it just gets worse and worse. And then it builds up over and over and over. Now they're sure something bad is in the house. They're right. They heard all those stories. They're right. You know, it's a demonic entity in this house. It's messing me up. It's all over the place. And then I come into the situation and I'm like, analyze it, look it over. And it's actually what I call a thought form or what I've heard call mm -hmm. also a thought form. Whenever we have a persistent emotional state that we're feeling over and over, we're expressing that energy. And sometimes that energy could be put into a little ball with a very simple program of scare me. Now, this thing exists in its own little world, its own reality. It only has one thought, just one thought, scare me so I could survive. So it gets the energy to survive because this thing is built out of fear energy it subsists off of fear energy. And when it starts to feel a little depleted, it'll poke that person at three o'clock in the morning when they're sitting by themselves with a little bit of fear energy. So now that person is feeling fear. They don't know why they're fe feeling fear, which makes them even more afraid. Now they're sure there's something bad in the room. So they're now generating this fear energy. And that thought form was like, oh, yummy. Thank you. I'm getting fed. It's not evil. It's not a malevolent thing. Mm. So is this, I believe they called Aggregor? No, no, that's not an Aggregor. Something different. Okay. Something different different, yeah. It's a little, okay. a little bit different concept, but that mm -hmm. thought form is doing nothing but just poking us with a certain energy so that we become a battery to feed it. Yeah. And when you can realize that it's just a thought form in the room trying to poke you with fear energy, if you can let yourself laugh, my first step of when encountering a negative entity is laugh. Because if you can genuinely laugh, you're setting up an energy state that would repel these things, if not poison them. At the same time, if what if you're misinterpreting? What if there's like a very benevolent spirit in the room and your senses are open and you're 
feeling them, but you remember all of those horror stories. You remember all the TV shows, the movies, you remember the stuff we were told as a kid and you're misinterpreting the spirit in the room. And now you laugh. It's not going to repel it. It's going to go, Oh, good. Hey, let's talk. Let's have a connection. And you're going to build a good rapport with this positive entity in the room because you're setting off this really good energy. So my response to people when they're feeling something negative or something malevol- potentially malevolent in the house, have a good laugh, have a good sense of awe and wonder of like, oh, wow, you're real. That's awesome. You know, a book flies across the room. Don't scream and run out of the room. Look at it with a sense of joy, a sense of wonder, which is what it might not want. It might not want you to be doing that. And if you go, wow, that was really cool. Do it again. I dare you throw another book. That's going to be funny. And if you really can have like that sense of awe and wonder going into this thing. If it is a malevolent spirit, it's going to like, Ooh, I don't like you. This is not what I want. And it's going to leave you alone. It's going to go away if you do this over and over again. Okay. Yes. And all that you just said makes perfect sense. Now, having said that, have you had any negative or scary or even dangerous encounters or experiences in your paranormal work? Sort of, but not really. I remember there was a time when I was a kid and my friends and I were hanging out by a little oxbow lake near our house out in the middle of the field. There was definitely some sort of a psychic attack happening. I was, you know, 17 years old. I wasn't quite sure what to do with it. So we ran, we all were feeling it. So we just ran and then I called in guidance and protection and they stopped it. They blocked it off. To this day, I don't really know what happened. But something was attacking us, but it was the, we were able to stop it. Another time was when I was really sick. I had like the flu. I was stuck in bed. I couldn't go anywhere. And I did feel something crawl into the room, like a big creepy crawly kind of thing coming to the room. But because I was aware of it, I knew it was there. I had the wherewithal to deal with it. And so I dealt with it and it was gone. It never came back. When I've worked with people and I've come into their homes, Sometimes there is the big, scary, nasty, but I have like this list of rules, like nine rules of interacting with the paranormal. And one of them, the biggest rule is similarities attract and perpetuate. Whatever your emotional energy state is, you're going to draw to you. Another one of the rules is that you are in charge of your energetic environment. Whatever you set around you is what's going to exist in that environment. And so when I've come into this home, We've just needed to shift the attitude. We can definitely clear energy. That definitely works. Set sanctuary, set the solid ground, but we shift the attitude and the awareness and the understanding of the people inside the house, which is why we do shadow work so that we can clear all of these things out. And when they've had this attitude change, it changes the energy of the home around them and these things no longer can exist there. Now, when it comes to the subject of like possession, that sort of thing, Let's start with like influences and obsession. We'll start at that level. Like all around us, we have spirits all the time. There's energy all around us and they are always influencing us, no matter what, positive, negative. Sometimes it's for their benefit. Sometimes it's for ours. Usually it's for ours. And I will even go so far to say that 90% of the thoughts and feelings we have are not our own. We are picking up on them. And if we don't have the awareness. We can't discern that. We think it's our own. And we go, yeah, let's go do this thing. Let's go do that thing. And we're like, we may not know why we're doing those things because we think it's our own, but that's the subtle influence. And there are certain types of entities out there that can create an obsession where we have this constantly repetitive thought or this constantly repetitive ideas and notions that can be like, oh, I need another drink. I need another drink. I need another drink or certain destructive behaviors because it's benefiting that spiritual being. And that's an obsession. That's really not possession. What I have encountered as quote unquote possession, meaning the spirit is residing within a person's energy field and it's doing that influence from inside has never actually been a malevolent entity. Never, never has been. What it's always usually been, and I'm sorry to say it this way, it's usually been the nagging overbearing mother that thinks they know better for their child, how they need to be living. And so that that parent, that mother comes in and says, I'm doing this, I'm doing this, I'm doing this. Sometimes it's been like a child. The person encounters a child spirit or somebody they knew in life that was a child. And they themselves are like, oh, let me take care of you. Let me nurture you. Let me care for you. And so they kind of bond 
in that way. And that child spirit is now having overt influence, having maybe overdue influence on that person. And that might be what we consider possession. But if we were to look at the the symptoms, and I say this with air quotes, the symptoms of possession of somebody flopping around in bed, cussing, getting violent, you know, saying things against certain religions or whatever, these characteristics did not come around until the exorcist. The exorcist made this up as part of their storytelling. And now there are people all over the world emulating this, thinking they're possessed. Sometimes it could be an obsession. Sometimes it could be a spirit. A lot of times it's mental illness. Now, where these symptoms came from and why we have these symptoms of a child flopping around the bed, uh, cussing and doing all of these sorts of things, we know today, and I'm and until I see something different, which I haven't in my decades of doing this work, until I see something different, I'm fully convinced that when it's a child doing this, that it's non-epileptic seizures brought on through conversion disorder, meaning there's chronic trauma going on in that house. A child is being abused. And if the emotional body cannot express itself in a safe way, that emotional body will express it through the body, through physical behavior. And so these classical symptoms, uh, or I say the modern symptoms of possession, is mental illness or conversion disorder. It's a person's body screaming out for help, not the soul. Yeah, well said. When we talk about intuition and spirit guidance, which I guess every person does have or can have or can recognize, what's the difference between the two in your view? And how do they fit into the paranormal work? The difference between intuition versus spirit guidance. They're very, very connected. They're very connected. In fact, I will say from my understanding, my experience in the work I'm doing, that the seat of intuition is the enteric nervous system. It's in the gut. We actually have three brains in our body. There's the physical brain in the head that is really great at organizing information. It feels some of the emotions. Then we have the heart as a brain center that has our energetic interconnection with other people that can really connect. Now, remember, the emotions are actually created by the limbic system in the brain, but our sense of connection, our sense of expansion is really that energetic level from the heart center. But the enteric nervous system is the oldest part of our nervous system, evolutionarily speaking. It's what gives you that gut intuition. It's what gives you that butterflies in your stomach, where you get that sinking feeling if something isn't going right. And that's your intuition. That's your intuition trying to communicate to you through the body. One of the things I teach people when doing seance or developing your paranormal abilities is I say, trust the goosebump rush. If you feel that you're getting some information in and you're not sure, like, should I say this? Is this something there? But yet you get that goosebump rush that goes yeah. up your back. That's the enteric nervous system communicating with your body saying, yes, this is something you need to say. So trust that goosebump rush. Now, the thing about the enteric nervous system is it understands abstract concepts. It only understands symbols. It's not even emotion because that's the realm of like the heart brain. It's abstract information. So for example, what I tend to say is your intuitive connection with the spirit guidance, they will communicate through the enteric nervous system. They're giving you the image of, let's say, a blue beach ball bouncing up and down on a beach by itself. And it just happens to be at dusk the sun's going down. Now the brain in our head is going, okay, that's cool, but that's meaningless. It's stupid. I don't, I don't know what this is all about, which is why people turn off their intuition because we need our brain to drive our cars, to go to our jobs, to communicate with other people. And it's used to running the bus. We need our conscious mind because it's used to running everything and being in charge of everything. But now the enteric nervous system is getting this intuitive hit about this beach ball. And it's saying, no, I'm communicating with somebody that was saying that they were dying alone and loneliness, that they really felt that pain of not having somebody around when they were at the dusk of their life. And that makes complete sense 
at the intuitive level to the intuitive brain and the enteric nervous system that viscera completely understands it and it makes total sense but the cognitive mind goes eh, that's dumb uh uh-uh. uh and so we have to work to commit build that connection between cognition and intuition so that our cognitive mind becomes a passive observer to the abstract information so now we can take it and move it from short term memory to long term memory and so that we can actually communicate it to somebody else who might be receiving it and guidance communicates through that enteric nervous system. It gives us basically the way I I talk about spirits, no matter if they're low level thought forms or super high level ascended master type, they always communicate with a nonlinear energetic language. And when we receive that, we receive that through the viscera of our enteric nervous system. And it means absolutely nothing to the conscious mind. So when the conscious mind gets that information, it has to pass through the imagination filter. You have to process it with information you already know in order to understand it, which is why it's always symbolic. And now you have to take that time to understand what those symbols mean, what those emotions mean to you. And as you start to unwind all of that information, now that guidance information makes so much more sense. And this is where I run into some challenges with clients all the time is they want to work with higher self. They want to work with their guides. And they're expecting a great gestalt type conversation like you and I are having here. They expect the guy to just like suddenly plop into the room and say, all right, now listen, <laughs> these things that you're doing are just not working out for you. you need to... And because they're not getting that, they think they're not having a conversation with a guide. But those moments when they're like thinking about their life, should I do job A? Should I do job B? Or should I go study for job C? And as they're thinking about job C, they suddenly glance at the clock and it's 11, 11. And they're like, oh, okay, that's cool. And they go on throughout their life and they're like, okay, I'm going to try applying for job A. And it's like, nothing works out. Everything just kind of falls apart. One thing after the other, like, okay, fine, let's go work on job B. And it's just the same kind of like drudgery getting there. And they're like, okay, well, let's go look at getting training for job C. Oh, here, here's a book on that. Where did that come from? Brian goes, oh, I thought you might look that, might need that. I don't know why, but I thought about giving that to you. And so that's guidance communicating to them through synchronicities. It's blocking them from the things that they think they want to be doing that just doesn't work out. But yet the stuff that they, that the guide wants them to do, just like they feel this urge, they feel this pull and it's just suddenly synchronistic moments happen to say, yes, do this. You're on the right path. Keep doing that thing. Okay. So what about intuitive guidance we can receive as specific clear information and insight through our sixth sense. So either through clairvoyance, clairaudience, clairsentience, etc. I mean, in my work, for example, with with clients, I, I do quantum coaching work, pretty much with every client in a session, I receive guidance, what to say, how to say, you know, what, what to do in a session, what question to ask, which I haven't thought about before. So, and I receive it as clear instructions, so to speak, or clear information, or it could be, I mean, I get goosebumps all the the time, which I can interpret as, yes, you know, this is the right thing to say or, or do. So a lot of people do receive clear information, which come from the intuition, guidance, guide, you know, whatever other source through their sixth sense outside of the five physical senses. So where does this fit into what you've just talked about? It's still the exact same process. I I have a whole diagram that I call the hierarchy of an experience that describes it. But basically, imagine that guide when you're working with a client and that guide gives you that information. You're receiving this abstract, nonlinear information. It's like a little packet. And then as you're processing that through your internal process, which is what you developed over those years of working with it. So you're able to discern what is external information that you've received versus internal, that you're receiving that information and you're aware of that, but then you are processing it with what you know and your information that you already have. And then you're able to communicate that to the client. I'll give you kind of a weird backward example of this. I know absolutely nothing about the financial world. I never studied finances. I'm still trying to figure out how to maintain cash flow. Finances have always been a challenge for me, but I'm getting better at it. So I I definitely don't have training in complex financial instruments. I don't have this kind of stuff. But I was working with a client who's who she is familiar with it. 
And her father was, you know, they had the education, they went to college for it. And when her father died, he left behind certain instructions and certain instruments for her to work with that she didn't know what to do with. She wasn't quite clear on those instructions. And I'm like, I've got no clue. I don't know where this stuff either. And so his, he is talking to me, giving her instructions on what to do. And I can only give her metaphors. I can only say, hey, this is what this thing looks like. And this is what that, and I'm only giving like analogies and metaphors because I don't understand these things at all. And then she responds, she's like, oh yeah, that's this thing and that thing. And he wants me to do this with it. And I'm like, great. I'm glad you understand that because I have no idea. Now, if somebody who had financial training and had this good financial understanding had also the training and understanding how to connect with guidance, they would receive that information from her dad and instantly know, oh yeah, this is that, this is that, and be able to communicate that. And it would seem to that person there, he's speaking very clearly in financial terms and financial language. And it would speak through because they already had that information within their mindset. But because I didn't, I had to struggle with metaphors and trying to explain it because I didn't have that information to plug it in, to go through. Mm -hmm. Okay. Well, thank you for sharing. This is an interesting example. So I guess we are pretty much on the same page here. Now, I like to talk about what I call echoes from the past or from our past lives or from other lives, if you you know, if we accept the concept of parallel lives and future lives from other than this life in short. And I, before I ask my question and your view on this, I'd like to share some thoughts. I believe that our intuition and echoes from our past lives can serve us on a very practical level. For example, we can be drawn to or repelled by certain people from the first moment of contact. When we are drawn to them, it's like, oh, I must meet this person. They are really lovely. There's something very familiar with them. And so we would seek their company. And at other times, we are instantly repelled by someone and the feeling is usually mutual. I have met such, I would say, several such people in my life in various situations, most of which required repeated contact. And the repulsion was so palatable. I could feel it both physically and emotionally. And those feelings were so strong that I was almost getting sick in their presence, even though they were nice people. But those feelings of repulsion were so strong. And sometimes there was anger or a strong dislike, sometimes fear or a combination of any. And I didn't want to have anything to do with them. And I really couldn't be in their presence. In some situations, as I said, our contact was inevitable. So I tried to rationalize those feelings. uh, As in this lifetime, as I said, they were just normal, nice, very nice people. But I couldn't. Or there could be someone who actually has sinister intentions in this lifetime towards us which we intuitively are picking up. So my point is that those echoes from our other lives, past, concurrent, or future, those karmic connections, the memories and insights we are getting from the outside of this reality, outside of our physical senses, not only validate our multidimensionality as a soul, but also serve some purpose. Could you please speak to this phenomenon, moving then on to the concept of karma, free will, and destiny, if you wish, because this will be my next point. A little bit, yes. One of the things that I always work with every individual client is an individual situation. And sometimes it's been a past life that is interfering, causing that. Sometimes it's a shadow, like something happened in this lifetime when they were a kid, and this person that they're repulsed by is doing something in the same way that something happened. Like maybe they had a bully when they were in elementary school that had a certain, I'm going to say lisp when they spoke. And now they're at an office place and one of the new coworkers has that same lisp. They don't understand why they're having that revulsion, but it's because there's an ancient shadow, an ancient, an old shadow from childhood just saying, ooh, this person's awful. I can't stand them. And it's at the visceral unconscious level. So they don't know why this person's setting them off. But you're right. It can be a past life. And I've actually worked with that with clients because I do some past life work when it's needed. 
there was a client that I had that was having a bit of a business transaction. I try to keep confidentiality with my clients as best as I can, so I'm keeping it purposefully vague. She had a business transaction with a person that she felt almost was like a sister. Like she couldn't believe that they're finally connecting. They're they're doing great. But yet this other person started to flake out, just wasn't quite there. It just wasn't working out. One person, my client, spent a lot of money on this deal. The other person just kind of took the money and ran. But my client is like, but what is it? Why do I have this connection? Why do we both feel this connection? Why is she doing this? And it was just a past life thing. They had a lifetime where they were together, that something happened, and there was a bit of a resolution that when they came into this life, that they're going to do this one thing, resolve this one issue, and they're done with it. And sure enough, there was some counseling of things to do in the, the physical real world and some information to share back and forth. And once that was done, the business relationship dissolved. It was over and it was not entirely amicable, which is how it needed to be, but it was that little bit of a leftover from a past life that was causing a business problem. And once that was dealt with at the personal level, interestingly enough, dealt with at the personal level in the modern world, that resolved that sort of karma, shall we speak. And that is a critical concept. It's interesting that you brought that up in this way because I had a client here in the office just last night, and this was the exact subject that came up about karma from a past life. And fortunately, they they knew what I was talking about because when I talk about karma, I don't mean like good things and bad things that you do a good thing and a good thing happens to you, you do a bad thing, a bad thing happens to you. And I don't mean it like the threefold law that whatever you cast out, you get three times more. Karma doesn't necessarily work that way. Karma is more like, here's what you need to experience. Here's what you need to have happen. And we can make these choices. Like I was telling about when I went from lifetime to lifetime, I made certain choices for those lifetimes and what I was going to be. That was, so to speak, the karma for that lifetime, the thing that I needed to experience. And so let's say I have a client that's working with something on a personal level And whatever they're doing, they can't resolve it. They've gone to the doctors if need be. They've gone to counselors if need be. They can't seem to resolve it. We'll do a past life regression. And in that past life, they go, oh yeah, in this specific matter, like money or relationships or whatnot, I'm just not going to deal with this. This is just not going to happen. And now we get to this physical lifetime and that's their karma, that they're going to experience this in a certain way. And so they do. And when they realize that's what it is, we go do the regression, we change that contract, we change that agreement, and that karma is now released and it's now let go. And now higher self or the soul can come in and say, all right, cool, that's released. Can we experience this now? And so now that becomes the karma of what they need to experience and that what they need to go through. At the same time, I love the work of Carolyn Elliott. She does something called existential kink, and she has a really amazing point of view on shadow work, that what if you are this great, amazing celestial being that can experience anything, can do anything, but what you cannot experience is strife and struggle and disappointment and frustration. And what if you specifically came into this lifetime to encounter certain challenging situations, and now that becomes your karma? And I'll give you a very weird example of this. My ex-wife had a friend many, many years ago, was a single mom with three kids, really working her butt off to try to support those three kids. And one of those children was severely mentally and physically handicapped. He was in a wheelchair. He couldn't speak. He needed full, constant attention. And that really tugged at my heartstrings. I really felt for that. And so I reached out guides to the guides to whatever, saying, how can I help? Can I give some energy? Can I do something? And I was surprised to find the soul of that child directly talking to me, directly communicating, saying, no, please stop. Don't. I know you're feeling compassion. I know you want to help, but my mom and I made this agreement in this lifetime to experience this toil together. And if you do anything, you're going to interrupt that process. You're going to interfere with what we need to do. Thank you for trying to help, but please stay out of this. It was very kind, very compassionate. And I was like, oh, I get it. That was the karma you brought in this life to experience together. And out of a compassionate heart, I could actually screw that up. So I need to stay out of it and let you experience that suffering because that's what you came here as an agreement to do. Interesting.
Yes. And I think this is probably one of the most difficult, if not the most difficult um, positions, if you like, or concept to embrace for us, you know, in this life, because suffering, pain, difficulties, challenges, hardships are pain. And we don't want to go through pain. We don't want to feel this pain. So we we want to do anything we, we can to alleviate the pain. But as you said, and and you know, intellectually and spiritually, I agree with you that we choose our destiny at the soul level. So the question then is, where do we draw the line? I mean, just to even expand it from an individual to, say, a community or even a nation, when there is a particular nation that is plagued with all sorts of issues, from wars to natural disasters to whatever you can think of, they have it. Do we just leave them to themselves to go through their karma and realize their karma? Or do we want to and come in to help in any way we can? Where do we draw the line, which is, I guess, an ethical question as much as as spiritual. Where do we draw the line, whether to help someone get out of the difficulties and challenges and painful situation or not? It's a very challenging question. And I don't have a direct answer for that because you're, you're right. It's ethical. There's a lot of variabilities involved in that because sometimes we are here to experience those things. And sometimes people do things to other people that really are awful. And that's not part of the plan because we have that free will. And to kind of make the long explanation short, sort of, is to realize that our life here in this world is a co-creative experience with our higher self. We as our individual have our own free will, as well as higher self has will, and we can work together. You know, the ego is not a bad thing. The ego is the self. The ego can balance needs versus wants versus what resources are versus what other people need. It can be that balance point. It doesn't have to be a bad thing. In the Vedic, in the Hindu tradition, higher self has two names. It has Brahman, which is a cosmic greater higher self that is like the super numinous being, but then there's Atman, which resides within us, which is in our day-to-day self. And they say Atman is Brahman or Brahman is Atman, depending on how you look at it. So they're one and the same. It's like a co-creative experience. And when you can connect with your higher self and you can feel that sense of purpose, if your purpose is to draw that line, is to go in there and stop that from happening, which it very well might be, then follow it absolutely do that. So ultimately what I tell people to do is work on your own spiritual development. Allow yourself to maybe even be a little bit selfish about your spiritual growth and your conscious evolution because by the fact that you are doing that, you are inserting that information of spiritual evolution and conscious growth into the collective unconscious. You are making it permissible for other people to do their spiritual work, to advance And those aggressors who are out there causing this destruction and causing this suffering will pick up on that and they'll start to ease. They'll start to do it less and less. And the fact that we know that this is working is because here in human history, despite what the news media tells you, okay, despite what news media is going to say, we are in the most peaceful, prosperous time in all of humanity by a long shot. The number of wars, the number of violent crimes, the number of aggression overall is in a dramatic decline worldwide. That's not always true in some places. Some places are still war and torn. There's still wars going on. There's still crime. Yes, absolutely true. But as an overall, the number is in a dramatic decline. And I will say that it has a lot to do with our conscious evolution, has a lot to do with our connectivity and our sharing of information, has a lot to do with how we are changing as a culture to rise above things that were once considered permissible that are now horrid and awful, and we don't do that anymore. So where do we draw the line? With yourself. You work to improve yourself to be the best version of you at the highest level that you can be, that will contribute to the continuing shift around the world. And if making that connection says 
you need to be that peacekeeper. You need to be that warrior. You need to be that diplomat. You need to be whatever to go in there and stop it and interfere with it. Then follow that will, follow that pull and do it because that is true for you. And if not, do your thing. It does make sense. But just now, a particular interesting example or a case study came to my mind of a family who had a very sick child. I believe the child had uh, had a brain tumor. The thing is that those parents refused any treatment for the child. They believe that they can just pray to God and, and you know, do, do the spiritual work to heal the child and they refused any medical intervention. The child has died in the end. And then the parents were charged with neglect, negligence, not rendering assistance, etc. So there were a number of charges. At first, everyone says, well, of course, you know, you need to render medical assistance and help and, and try to, you know, save the child. But then someone raised an ethical question from the spiritual perspective. Well, what if those parents knew that this was a, the chosen path for the child's soul? So, but this became not only an ethical question, but obviously a legal question. So the parents in the end were charged with neglect because the child has died. I mean, I know it's a really long stretch for this conversation, but just to keep it short, what would be the best approach in such circumstances where an opinion or a view or spiritual development of an individual is overridden by the social structures, such as the law, social services, etc.? I mean, this becomes quite complex, and I don't know whether we have the answer. Perhaps the answer is, as you were saying, to keep promoting that spiritual development at the individual level, because as it grows and reaches the momentum, the critical mass, it will percolate and start changing our social structures. What do you think? Yep, exactly. There's unfortunately no simple answer to that at all. There's just no way, because every situation's different. Everything's going on in a, so many different ways. There's a lot of factors, and that's true. The thing that we can do is just do our own work and what's coming to mind is allow ourselves to look at it on multiple levels, like maybe on the boots on the ground, day-to-day -day kind of level, let ourselves be outraged by something like that. Just let us be like, oh, we can't let that go on. Let ourselves be outraged. At the next level, try to maybe have some understanding of where those parents were coming from, what their upbringing was, what their worldview was like, why they would make such a choice, knowing this is key part, knowing that they absolutely did love their child and that they really did want the best. And if we can assume that they were trying to do the best for their child, even though this one part of us wants to be outraged and says, oh, nope, they made these mistakes. Let's have that heartfelt, try to understand where they're coming from just for that moment. Then at the above that, how is that going to affect the continued growth of society, the growth of humanity? What, what factions are going to come out of this? How are they going to conflict or not conflict? What sort of outcomes will come in that way? And even overall, let's say a thousand years passes from now, what kind of effect will this have on the collective growth of humanity? If we allow ourselves to look at the situation on those multiple levels, we'll pull ourselves out of the trap of the 3D world. We'll pull ourselves out of like, oh, it's got to be binary. It's got to be black and white, good, evil will pull us out of that and see the overarching effects that it can have. And that will help us better understand things that we can do for ourselves, for our community, for our loved ones, so that we can help move things in a more beneficial direction rather than go head-to-head -head conflict. Because if we go head-to-head -head conflict with something like this, it might cause those type of people to dig in even harder and cause them to be even stronger in their beliefs and their behaviors, which could maybe be more damaging to the whole of humanity. But if we can approach it with some compassion, some try to understanding, and what would we want for them, then we can use that outrage energy in a more positive way to maybe enact some change in a good way that will be lasting. Absolutely. Now let's change pace a bit and move into a bit more lighthearted territory, still important questions. <laughs> but I've got a couple of hairy questions for you in the space of free will and information in the quantum field or universal consciousness. The question is, when we make a choice, is it our free will to pick one of the many possibilities that are in the quantum field 
at that point in time? Or is our choice already predestined? So to put simply, does the universe already know what choice or decision we are going to make as it is all (laughs) pre-programmed? Harry, question. (laughs) Yep. I ultimately, I don't know yet. What do you think? I don't know because everything, every time I think I've got it figured out, it changes or I gain a new level of perspective. I've got a really complex point of view on that right now, that we live in what seems to be fixed time. Like everything seems to be, it's destined, it's supposed to happen. It appears to be that way. Now, if we look at science, science will say, oh yeah, everything is predetermined. It's like the entire universe has happened all at once, all in the blip of a second, and that our brain is just sorting it out in linear fashion, but it's already there. It's Mm -hmm. all done. And there's like experiments to show that this is the way it works. So there's that one level that says, nope, it's all predetermined. Life is determinism. There is no free will. But working with beings that exist in a different sense of time that we do, and I call them temporal beings because they flow through time in a way that seems 3D to us. And the way that they've explained it to me is that time is layers of probability and possibility. That there's like, look, almost you can think the vertical axis is probability and the Mm -hmm. vertical or horizontal axis is possibility. And that they build a 3D environment based off of this. And so they can see, like if you were to roll a die, they could see all six of those die, those all six of those outcomes happening all at once. But then they see the possibilities that maybe you're using a 10-sided die or that you're using a purple die and a white die or that you're not even throwing one at all. They can see those things. And so they exist in all of this and they can flow through all of those things, which modern science would say, well, that's fixed, predetermined. That's just how it is. And what they are fascinated by us by, they're actually absolutely blown away by that is because all of these things exist in like a virtual probable state. They don't exist in an actual collapsed state. Yeah, They're fascinated by us because we create through observation. And when we observe a potential moment, that collapses that potential existence into an actual existence. And what we perceive as a single straight line of time going in one single direction they see is this twisty, turvy, up and down, left and right, going all sorts of directions that we're weaving this complex maze through these layers of possibility and probability. And they're just blown away by that. They're blown away by our linear existence of creating through observation when they exist in layers of possibility and probability. And Welcome to know, Earth. Exactly. <laughs> So ultimately, is there free will or is it predetermined? It seems like the answer is both, but neither. And that there's something yet outside that we haven't yet experienced or understood that gives us a better understanding of free will versus predetermined existence. Yes, I love your answer. I really do because it makes a lot of sense and it is your typical quantum answer. And I love those quantum paradoxes, as I call them, because they, they are just like tickling my, my brain. <laughs> and I love them. So, yes, our conclusion is that yes. both we do have free will and we make a choice at that point in time when we do. But at the same time, because we are drawing from the infinite number of possibilities and we can't choose something that is not already in the pool of possibilities, effectively, it is at the same time and in this respect, predetermined. I love it. Beautiful. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> and my, my second uh, question uh, in this vein, which I guess links obviously to, to this point, is that when we imagine something, say in, you know, in our meditation, we work on manifesting something and, and we are imagining because obviously we need to imagine something in order to manifest it in our life. 
when that thing or situation or object does manifest in our physical reality, when we do manifest it, the question is, did we actually create that thing or scenario or unconsciously validated one of our potential futures that already exists in a quantum field? So that's in the same vein. Beautiful. Oh, I'm loving it. Is there such a thing as consensus reality? And how can we reconcile our subjective realities projected inside our brain through our personal filters with the objective reality that we all interact with more or less the same in the same way? So is there such a thing as consensus reality or are we all sleeping somewhere in the cosmic matrix program, dreaming our life that has both the subjective and objective side to it. <laughs> <laughs> I thought I had that once figured out. And it's one of those things where ultimately I, I tell people, if you ever find an answer, you went the wrong way. But if you find that you have the ability to ask better questions, that's the direction mm -hmm. you want to go. You want bigger and better questions. And so consensus reality, yeah, I had something I used to call commonly agreed upon reality, where it was an overlap of our minds creating our experience, but it was a subjective that created the objective through our overlap expectations and our overlap communication. And looking forward in time, backward in time, overall reality, I don't know anymore. I don't know if there was some being that was here before or some civilization that was here before that created what we call the foundation, or is it like what Robert Lanza talks about in biocentrism, that the universe exists simply because we're observing it, and the fact mm. that we observe it, we are creating all of the temporal activity that needed to happen to bring that moment into existence just by our awareness of that moment. My answer is I'm still trying to figure this out. I, I don't I don't think I know yet, but I'm still formulating the questions to ask that so I get a better understanding of it. Mm, thank you. Absolutely. Yes, I, I don't think anyone knows the answer to it, like the real answer to it, uh, just like we don't really know what is consciousness. We have obviously many different hypotheses and views and opinions, but perhaps that's something just like the notion of God or the creator that defies any explanation or, or any description. So we simply can talk about it, we can feel it, we can interact with it, we can we can work with it, but we but we can't really define it. And but still, yeah, it's a good fun to to think about it. <laughs> okay, Kedrick, I've got just one final question before we talk about your work and your courses and your programs. And obviously, I will include all the links in, in my show notes so that people can contact you and engage with you if they wish to. But there's just another final question, again, in the series of my burning questions. <laughs> Recently, I had an interesting insight about healing in view of the universal principle that energy can't be created or destroyed. So the energy is finite in, in cosmos, in the universe, and it can only change form or move to another dimension. In other words, change frequency. So I think that if we can really accept and understand this principle, we would know that we cannot really kill a virus or bacteria. We can only force their energy or entice their energy to leave the physical form, which we can see under the microscope, for example, and move to another dimension, thus leaving our body in peace. So this is a completely different paradigm of thinking about illness and, and disease, which opens the door to changing our approach from violent enforcement to persuasion and enticement. And I remember reading somewhere a very interesting case study, which was an amazing true life case of a woman having an inoperable brain tumor. She's tried various natural therapies, chemotherapy, everything, every treatment she could access to no avail. 
So basically, there was no solution given to her, and, and her days were numbered, so to speak. And one day, having absolutely nothing left, she decided to stop hating the tumor and instead started sending it her love and understanding that it simply tried to survive. I'm now getting goosebumps. Asking it to move to another dimension where it will find much better conditions to live. And after a few weeks, it did move on. It was completely gone to the shock and amazement of her doctors. So what do you think about this new paradigm of the way we think about illness and disease again in the with the concept that energy can't be destroyed so we can't really kill anything we can only move it elsewhere what do you think i have to ponder that one physical healing has never been a strength of mine it's never been one of my aptitudes but i get what you're saying there it goes back to that concept i had earlier similarities attract and perpetuate and you're you are in charge of your energetic environment and the same is true of the body you know energy and information are synonymous so it makes sense that if we're going to fight and we're going to hate the tumor we're going to fight we're going to hate the disease that it's going to dig in and get harder and there are other studies to support that for example i've gotten training in hypnotherapy in a lot of different ways a lot of different modalities, so to speak. And one of them was for chronic pain. And there are studies that show that a person who may be in a chronic pain at like level seven, eight to 10 all the time, the moment that they change their attitude about that pain, where they can say, okay, you're a constant companion. Uh, The pain's going to be here forever. I'm not going to try to fight you. I'm not going to get rid of you. I'm not afraid of you anymore, that I welcome you, that you're just something that's going to be with me. They're chronic pain levels drop to like three or four with that level of acceptance. So we've seen that with pain. And I can understand that with tumor because I've heard of a number of stories of people who, when they got the diagnosis of cancer, they said, okay, I'm just going to live this life wonderfully. I'm going to be happy. I'm going to enjoy every moment. And that caused the shift at the biochemical level in their body that the cancer could no longer survive, that it moved on because they changed their inner world. But at the same time, I've known other people said the same thing and the the cancer took root. A lot of variables there, but I like what you're saying. It's something I want to explore a little bit more because I don't know yet, but it gives me something to think about and something to experiment with, something to test, not necessarily with cancer. I'm not throwing this out there for cancer, but I'm going to throw it out there for other things. Like what if we get a cold saying, okay, great. I know the viruses are trying to survive. Is there a better environment for you to go to? I do the same thing with spirits that are lingering here that shouldn't be where they are, but there might be a better place for them. And that works. I never thought of using it for illnesses, but it makes sense. Mm. I actually, I can share just generically that I am actually using this approach with my own health, with particular health situations, and it works. It actually does work, have a particular protocol I have devised. So I have tested it on myself and it does work. That's why I just wanted to to bring it up because it opens a whole new world and, and, and opens a new door to, you know, for the research and study and testing. And it is, again, based on the on the basic principle that energy cannot be destroyed. So if you are thinking you are going to kill this virus, you think again, because you cannot destroy the energy of the virus. You can destroy its physical shell, which you know you can see under the microscope, for example. But you cannot destroy the the energy called virus. You can only move it to another reality, another dimension, and a different frequency, so that it leaves your body. Okay, beautiful. Before we find ourselves in the middle of the night with this, <laughs> with, this, with this beautiful conversation. Let's now talk about your work, your courses. Could you tell us a little bit more? And once again, I will include all the links in the show notes. What are the paranormal arts training courses that you offer? And also about your appearances, your w- webinars, workshops. Could you please tell us about your offerings? Thank you. Sure. Thank you. Yes. 
if you go to kadrick.teachable.com, you'll find my paranormal courses there. I've got like a course to develop your paranormal abilities and use them in a very practical way that you can test and validate them. I've got a course on how to do seances, how to run seances, uh, something about how to get familiar with your spiritual neighbors, the different type of spirits that are out there, how they communicate, how you can interact with them. I even have a course on using runes in seance to compare the runes. And I've got a course that I got to launch soon. I've got it all recorded. I just got to put it out there about uh, Norse necromancy, the old Norse style, but in a modern way. Plus, I've got some shadow courses on there. I've got like a beginner intro course on shadow work, and I've got a good six-week in-depth course on shadow work where it's not only videos and audios and PDFs, but we work together one-on-one to go into these shadows. So we work together just like one-on-one, not a group setting. So I've got that. And if you go to my webpage, kdrick.com, I've got a tab on there called services where you can schedule one-on-one sessions like spirit readings, spiritual guidance. We can do past life work. You can even get some bundles. Like if you bundle them together, you can save some money. We can do like three sessions or five session bundles, which are a lot more effective than doing just one off here or there. You get a lot more out of it. And so that's really the two best ways to find my offerings is kdrick.teachable.com or kdrick.com. Plus, I'm all over YouTube, Facebook, Instagram. Feel free to reach out to those social media sources. I'm there all over the place and happy to answer any questions. Mm -hmm. Beautiful. And you also do webinars, workshops, yes? Yes, I occasionally have a class through a a group called University Magicus. It's like Mm -hmm. a little little class here or there, Uh, various things coming up. I don't have anything quite scheduled after this month yet for that, but that's okay. I, I'm actually working on building some new online courses. I'm working on an eight-week program and some pretty intensive stuff. So that's coming soon. Plus, if you go to Gaia.com, you'll find a bunch of interviews and shows that I'm on with Gaia.com. So that's a, that's a good place to find some of the stuff too. Well, uh, Kedrick, I think it's time for us to wrap it up. It's been an amazingly beautiful Indeed. and invigorating and engaging conversation. So thank you so much. Awesome. But before we close, I would like to ask, do you have any particular final thought or a message that you would like to leave our audience sure. with? The thing that's coming to mind is to be willing to let go of expectation. Expectation of what the paranormal has to be, expectations of what communication with spirit has to be, even expectation of what your life is supposed to be. And just treat them as the experience, as the moment. Take them for what they are. Because oftentimes we miss stuff saying, oh, if my mom's going to talk to me, she has to say things this way. She's got to tell me this kind of thing. When it might come as a completely different way. Or if higher self is working with me, it's got to be like this. It's got to be that way. And if you're expecting things to be a certain way, you might miss it. But if you're open-minded, if you're playful about it, if you're going to have fun with it a little bit, not take it so seriously, you might surprise yourself about what's right there in front of you that's been trying to get your attention this whole time. And then just treat that as like the experience, the fun of seeing where that goes. And that will open a lot more doors for you than saying, it's got to be this way and in that, that manner. And I have to see it like this. Just let yourself experience it for what it really is, not what you think it has to be. Mm, beautiful. Thank you so much for your words of wisdom. And it's been such a pleasure to be chatting with you. And thank you for being on Quantum Living. Thank you for having me. This has been a great time. I, I appreciate you very much. Thank you. Thank you so much. All the best. Please stay with me just for a moment, as I'd like to share with you an important insight I received a few days after we recorded this interview. At some point, we talked about energy attachments and a possible new paradigm for healing I have been testing, all in the context of the basic principle that energy is the finite and fixed quantity in the cosmos. It cannot be destroyed or created, and it can only change form and move across the space-time continuum. When I suggested that we cannot really kill the virus, for example, as this would violate the laws of physics, but we could move the energy called virus to another dimension by convincing it that it will be better off elsewhere rather than in our body, 
Picking up on that point, Kadrick said that he uses this approach to remove entity attachments by reasoning with them psychically to move to a better place where they will be much happier. So to recap, we both agreed that to move a particular energy elsewhere, i.e. to another dimension, we would do so either by psychic persuasion or by changing its frequency somehow. But there is also a third way, which is the insight I have received, in a factual metaphor. I don't know if such a term exists, (laughs) I just made it up. (laughs) So... As we now understand that a huge amount of important spiritual and metaphysical messages and truths are embedded in Hollywood movies, which we are decoding one by one, I was shown in my mind an episode of Star Trek, which is peppered with encoded information, by the way, which showed me the third way to peacefully remove unwanted energy from our body or our energy field. Here is a brief synopsis. The ship, Star Trek, inadvertently killed in space a large unknown creature looking like a huge blob. Shocked by this accidental death, the crew saw that the blob was a mother who had just given birth to a baby blob. Yet there was nothing they could do to help, and so with deep regret and sorrow they turned the ship around and continued on their journey. Several hours later, They noticed an unexplained drain on the ship's energy resources. Upon close examination of the ship, they discovered that the newborn baby blob was attached to it, suckling their energy like milk to survive. Now they had a serious dilemma, as the power levels on the ship were getting dangerously low. They could kill the baby, but of course they didn't want to. It's enough that they killed its mother. As they were brainstorming what to do, the chief engineer got an idea. Let's go back to the colony of those blobs to return the baby to them, he says. And in the meantime, we need to wean the baby off the milk. (laughs) Let's make the milk the baby needs, which is the energy powering the warp drive, unpalatable to it. Let's spoil the milk. They did that by changing the frequency of that energy to a really bad one somehow, and by the time they got back to the colony, the baby blob had probably got a gastro (laughs) and a bad diarrhea (laughs) and was so disgusted with the taste of the juice that it finally let go, floating into the loving arms of its blob family. (laughs) I love that story. So, can you see the message, how to remove an unwanted energy from your body or energy field? Simply make your frequency so different and so unpalatable to it, so that it can't feed on you anymore. It doesn't want to. Since we usually want to get rid of low-frequency energies and entities, this means raising our frequency to the level it is no longer attractive or even suitable for them. Conversely, be mindful that the low-frequency auric fields attract low entities and all the nasties. Drinking, drugs, smoking, low-frequency emotions like anger, rage, fear, hatred, also mental disorders, weaken our immune system and our energy field and become blinking invitations to sickness and entity attachments. And how can you change your frequency quickly when you sense some negative energy coming at you? Actually, Kedrick has already told you. Laugh! Laughter and generally good sense of humor are both high-level vibrations. There are many documented scientific tests and clinical studies of completely relieving patients of depression with a daily dose of laughter. No medication. That's not good for the entity which wants to feed on your depression or anger or fear. As they say, laughter is the best medicine. And I will add, on many more levels than one. That's all for today, folks. I hope you enjoyed this episode. And if you really loved it, please post a review on Apple Podcasts or Spotify to encourage others to listen to it. For the show notes, guest and podcast info, reviews, comments, and much more, please visit quantumlivingpodcast.com. 
And if you'd like to dive deeper into quantum living and explore how you could work with me, please contact me and I'd be delighted to help and support you on your quantum journey. I am your host, Anna Anderson. I look forward to connecting with you in the next episode of Quantum Living. Until then, keep your vibrations high and be well.